everybody loves a great comeback story. When somebody's been down and out or they've really had some challenges and we see them come back, you know, we, we see this with Hollywood stars. We see it really with politicians across the board. And especially as Americans, we do, we love a great comeback story. Well, today we're going to dive into this and so much more with my guest. Today I have with me Holly Bertone. She is a former FBI chief of staff for counterintelligence turned certified holistic health coach. She helps midlife women to find the clues where they can prioritize their health And so their high achievement lifestyle does not clash with weight gain and lack of energy and restless nights, something that happens a lot through perimenopause. Holly spent 20 years in project management, consulting, and federal government service. After her own experience with breast cancer, healing herself from an autoimmune disease, and creating a no-conflict divorce, she learned there's more to life than burning the candle at both ends. As a certified holistic health coach, she helps women to combine the principles of high performance and mindset while ditching the diet culture and creating sustainable results. Holly, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Carol, for having me. Well, this is the first. You were chief of staff for counterintelligence at the FBI. I've I've never had um, anyone from the FBI on the show, and I'm curious, and I know the listeners are too, what brought you from the FBI to holistic health coaching? Yeah. Oh my goodness, Carol, such a great question. And yeah, there's a lot of curiosity here because it, the, the two don't make sense to connect, but I, I, I want to thread the needle here. So I was, um, it was post 9-11 and I was working for a consulting company. They asked us all to get our security clearance after 9-11. So I got my clearance and one of my managers who was working down in Quantico called me up and said, Hey, Holly, you know, I've got this job at the FBI. Do you want to come work for me? I'm like, Oh my goodness. Yes. This was my dream job since I was in high school. And so I jumped at the opportunity. And so I was in project management. I wasn't an agent. Um, so I was a data nerd. I did a lot of project management and data analytics. But at that point, and you kind of have to go back to the, where we were, and this was 2003, you know, 2004, where we were f- from a technology perspective and where our government agencies were from a technology perspective. We weren't talking to each other. The, the you know, Congress came out with the 9-11 Commission, the WMD Commission report, and they basically said the agencies need to start talking it, within themselves, they need to be more organized, and then they need to start talking to each other. So we had these antiquated databases and systems and everything like that. So one of my big jobs was to look at internal systems, processes, organizations within, you know, within the organization and figure out how to put the pieces back together. And I want to pause here for a second, because this makes perfect sense. When I was about 10 years old, I loved to do puzzles and I got bored though, because they got to be too easy. So we had this huge dining room table. So I would get three different thousand piece puzzles, dump them on the table, mix them up and then put them together. Like total nerd alert. Okay. (laughs) So this is what I did as a kid. This is just how my brain naturally works. And this is what I just fell into at the FBI was looking at these disparate pieces in, in the FBI and putting these pieces together. And I guess I did a good job because they then brought me in as the chief of staff for the counterintelligence program management office. And we looked at a lot of data analytics. We looked at past, uh, we looked at the threats and, you know, and, and past data to predict those future trends. So fast forward, um, and, and I don't, we can jump into this. I don't want to gloss over it, but to really make that connection fast forward. Uh, 2010, I was diagnosed with breast cancer on my 39th birthday. I went through surgery, chemo, radiation. And then one year later was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is uh, autoimmune disease. And at that point, my health just kept getting worse and worse to the point where I had to resign from my dream job at the FBI. It was just, it was just too much. I I couldn't do everything and I needed to figure out a way how to rest and how to heal. 
And that was what got me on to the path of becoming a certified holistic health coach, healing myself. And then what happened was I turned 49. And here's kind of the plot twist was, and and I know you have a similar story when, when you hit about that same age is I was, I was in my twenties, I was 40, 45 pounds overweight. In my thirties, I dropped all the weight. I was a competitive athlete and mountain bike racer. And, you know, I was very thin, but I ate a lot of processed food and lived this just completely stressful life. So even though I was thin, I wasn't healthy. So now I'm staring at 49. I've, you know, healed myself. I'm relatively thin at that point, but 49 has taken its toll. And everything that I learned as a health coach wasn't working. And I felt flabby and just frumpy and just completely fried. And I was like, okay, what I learned in school isn't working anymore. And and that vibrant energy that I used to have was completely gone. And I was like, okay, I'm, you know, entering into this year where I'm going to to turn 50 is going to be the next big milestone. I'm like, I need to figure out how to how to just get this vibrancy back. And that's when I was on a mission. And then that's really when the coaching started to take off as as well, because what I found is that there's so many other women in this stage of life, you know, in their 40s and 50s who are just like, oh my goodness, what happened to my body? Like, it's just, it's not working anymore. The, the weight's coming on, I'm doing all the things and it's, it's, it's nothing is working anymore. So that's when I go back to being a 10-year-old with all the puzzles on the table. That's where I go back to my days at the FBI and I, you know, I take all of the disparate pieces and then put them back together and help my clients put them back together. Because I think, and I know, you know, as, you know, as a coach, it's like, you know, it's, it's not our job to do it for them. It's, it's our job to help them figure out how to do it for themselves. And, you know, and that's what I love to do is help my clients learn what those pieces are and, and help them to put them back together. I love the analogy of the puzzles. I, I was a big puzzle person too. I, in fact, there's a very old picture of me. My brother like snuck up behind when he didn't know, uh, or I didn't know he was behind me. And he had this, you know, fancy camera, black and white and took this picture and I'm so intense. I love it because it's so natural. And I'm so intense on these puzzle pieces in front of me. And I can relate. FBI would have been, boy, a dream job for me as well. Yeah. I didn't take that path. But I know that must have come with a lot of stress, too, to, to yes. have all this information coming at you, trying to put the pieces together, seeing trends, I would imagine, especially at that period of time would be extremely stressful. Yes. And then the part of your story where you're talking about, oh, I've got to figure this out. I'm 49. Because I did relate to that as, you know, being a marathon runner, doing all of the cycling and the distance running and all of the cardio and all of a sudden looking and going, oh, you know, I, I look worse and not better because I'm not, you know, doing the things. So, so you have this kind of approach If somebody's coming to you, maybe things are not working. I, I find, cause we're working with, you know, basically the same demographic yeah. that it is a puzzle sometimes because you, you might be helping them dial in their diet and get the movement and get the exercise. And then the needle's still not moving forward. How do you go about figuring out what is the thing or what are the things that they need to change or maybe tweak a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. First, actually, I'd like to, to kind of piggyback on what you said. And, you know, just an interesting analogy is that when I was in my 30s, you know, and, and competitive, I was eating like crap. I mean, processed food, six cans of Coca-Cola a day. I was a sugarholic. But because I was in my 30s and because I was so active, you know, I was 110 pounds. But then at 49, you know, I was, you know, at that point, probably a hundred and, you know, 120. So still within a healthy range, but not, you know, not to where I, I used to be, but I was eating all of the healthy foods. So, and I think it's interesting, the, the dichotomy between the two of how our bodies change. And when we get to this point and what I, what I like to do first 
is really think about what got us here in the first place. Because when we look at traditional diet culture, 92% of diets fail. So we're looking at an industry that is basically setting us up to fail. It's only got an 8% success rate. So the first question is, why is, why does this, why is this? Why does this happen? Two thirds of women between the age of 40 and 60 are clinically overweight. So why does this happen? And I think there's a lot of different factors. I don't think it's one and one specifically. I think number one, just, you know, our bodies change just from a you know hormonal perspective, our bodies just change. Number two, what used to work before doesn't work anymore. Number three, our body's needs have changed in terms of the, the nutrition that we need. Number four, we're in a place where cortisol has taken over. And we're just running this stress-filled life between our jobs and family and aging parents and all of the things that we juggle in midlife. And, and I always kind of joke, if you play the game of rock, paper, scissors between, between cortisol and nutrition and exercise, cortisol is going to win mm-hmm. every single time. And cortisol is going to be like, yeah, you're going to put on weight and I'm bringing my friends and it doesn't matter how much you exercise or how could you eat. So we're dealing with that. And then also just all the processed foods that we have and the chemicals that they put in and, you know, the glyphosates and the seed oils and, you know, all of these things that I think a lot of people just don't understand, you know, how everything can, you know, cause this weight gain, not to mention, and and here's really where I want to go is when I talk about a comeback, so many people think, oh, like a breast cancer and I'm coming back. But really, when we think about a comeback, it's, it's those every, it's just the everyday life that bombards us that over time, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's 10, 15, 20 years. And we wake up and we're like, what happened? Where did my life go? Why am I not happy? And this is really where, you know, where I really like to talk about the comeback Because so often we think, okay, we'll go back to like childhood trauma. Everyone likes to blame childhood trauma. And it may or may not be the case. But so often what I see is, yeah, there's there there is some, you know, potentially some some childhood trauma, but it's just everyday life that accumulates over the years and really causes us to be in that state where, you know, we've got a lot of people pleasers, a lot of women are people pleasers in midlife. And, you know, we give that power away. Or, or, you know, maybe we've gone through a divorce. Maybe we, you know, we're, we're angry or bitter or resentful about some of those things. Maybe we have had some tragedies in the past that we're still grieving. We haven't let go of. And what happens is that we, we come to this milestone and we say, okay, I, it's a milestone birthday. It's a, you know, a fancy dinner. It's, a, it's, a, it's an event. It's a vacation. And we're like, I'm going to lose the weight. We get excited. You know. And that excitement's going to last about two weeks. So we start is what I call the base camp cycle. So we start at that base of the mountain. We are going to climb that mountain. We're going to lose the weight. We've got this event. And it's going to last about two weeks. Because again, back to the 92%, back to New Year's resolutions, right? At, at that two or three weeks. But then what happens is that, okay, this diet, I'm starving myself, you know, I'm, and then it gets hard. And when it gets hard, the willpower kicks in. So the willpower kicks in for about one more week. And then something happens, just whatever random obstacle of that day, that just completely derails our progress. And we're like, you know what? I'm just going to start again on Monday. So instead of climbing the mountain, instead of losing the weight and exercising better and getting back into being healthier, we're right back at base camp. And this is the cycle. And I'm sure you see it too, over and over again. So going back to that place of what got us here in the first place, well, our future becomes what we feed it. So if we feed our future from this disempowering state, this is what it's going to look like. And when I say our future becomes what we feed it, I mean, literally and figuratively, like from a you know, mental mindset perspective, but also what we put in our mouth, right? And so, but we, we keep repeating this cycle and never stop to say, why isn't this working? What a great question to ask ourselves, the why. Because I, I do see this a lot. 
and I've worked with so many women as you have, and I see this start, stop, start, stop. And it's frustrating for them. It's frustrating for the coach because you know, you see the potential, you see where they can go, but they'll go so far and then turn back. And then I think women really have this all or nothing mindset, I call it, um, for lack of a better terminology, where, okay, you know, I ate the cookies, so I might as well eat the bag, or I didn't do everything perfectly. And I, I've seen that a lot when, when I do check-in calls with women, I'll see their progress like, wow, you're, you know, you're down a half inch in the waist, down in the hips a little bit, pictures are looking better, you're, maybe they're, they're doing about 80% of the program or even 75, but they will key in on that 25% they haven't been able to yet implement and then get defeated internally and, and kind of block their own progress. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it too is, you know, you, you've got reward eating, you've got stress eating and, you know, in the emotional eating, but reward eating, I think is the one that we always forget about because it's, oh, I had this long, hard day. The boss made me stay at work or, you know, I've been so good. I've stayed on my diet. I'm going to reward myself. We, we, you know, as children, we were given treats as a reward when we did something good. And it takes us back to that place. It, it gives us that worm and snuggly. Our, our brain is always looking for homeostasis. I always say a homeostasis is like when you're, you're, it's the equivalent of your brain on the couch with a cup of hot chocolate in your favorite <laughs> mug watching a Hallmark movie. Like our brain wants to be in homeostasis all of the time. And that's, that's a big piece of it is we go back to that place. Like, um, and I remember, and, and, and I'm raising my hand. I was in the front of the line. Like I've experienced all of this and, you know, and I remember there were times where, you know, I'd open up the freezer and I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to have a few bites of ice cream. And I would always get little pints. I was like, just have a few bites of ice cream. And the next thing I know, my spoon is scraping the bottom of the container. I was like, Oh, how did that happen? So, you know, a, a lot of it is just so it's, it's subconscious that we don't even realize we're doing it. Mm. Very true. I did the same with ice cream was definitely my my pleasure, my guilty pleasure. It's really funny because it was uh, chocolate mint. That was the thing. It always had to be chocolate mint my whole entire life. I can't stand the flavor now. I tried buying a protein shake that had that flavor thinking, oh, I'm going to relive, you know, my childhood here. Can't stand it because I had moved past that, no longer wanted the chocolate mint ice cream. But I did the same thing. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to have a couple of bites. Yeah. And then I was a marathon runner. So the scale wouldn't necessarily go out. Like I'd get away with it. But then it was the body composition that was the issue where, where muscle was dropping. I was doing all this cardio. Inflammation was rising from the cortisol. You know, you get this kind of perfect storm going. And we don't even, we don't even really know it's, I think women are more keyed in now, but when I was going through the process, nobody was talking about cortisol. I didn't even know what it was. Nobody was talking about body composition, menopause, perimenopause. I literally had to just kind of go through the fire and find out for myself. Yeah. But I think going back to the idea of the comeback, and you said like the, you, you're, you're really your, your challenge with breast cancer, and then you had mentioned the autoimmune. So you don't really consider that part of your comeback, maybe the catalysts that move you in that oh. direction. Oh, absolutely. It's a comeback. It's a huge comeback. But what I'm saying is so many people think, they think of a comeback like something big like that, Huge. like breast cancer mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. But I want to make sure like a comeback is just, just coming back to our everyday selves, you know, coming back to that place where we are vibrant again, where we have that energy again, where we feel good about ourselves, where we're living in that dream body. And, you know, and, and we're living in that place that, that vibrance of our, of our youth. And, you know, I think when, when people hear comeback, they think it's got to be something big where I'm saying it doesn't have to be big. It could be something small. It could be something every day. Mm. No, that's a really good point because we do tend to think of pivots in life. And it's interesting. That's been really a theme of the last few podcast guests I've had. We've talked a lot about those midlife pivots, doing something different, finding your purpose. And we do tend to think of that as something really big. Um, yeah. such as surviving cancer or, 
you know, completely changing the course of our life in some way. And it can be the, the small things, taking back our power of our health, for instance, yeah. most definitely. So you were working at the FBI, you received this diagnosis, which had to be a shock. I, I'm imagining, um, you know, you're relatively young, you, you, you're on top of your career, how I know it brought you into that holistic space, but but how did that how did that go? What was that path like? Yeah, it was long and sorted and twisted because I I mean I didn't know anything about the health space other than just being a competitive athlete. So when I was diagnosed, I just did everything the doctor said. They said I'm young. It was a it was a ERPR positive, HER2 negative, so it was a slow and small and what they called a lazy tumor. But in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm 39. I want to get this out and not realizing, you know, anything else, like just very traditional medicine. So I, I went through the, the surgery, chemo, radiation, and then that next diagnosis came and I was like, oh, wow. And I, and I lived in this place of almost, it was a victim, it was a victim status, but it was more than that because it was almost like, I just thought that this was what happens. Like after you have cancer, you just get sick and this is just how it's supposed to be. And I didn't realize that, no, there's things that you can do to, you know, reverse these symptoms. And I, you know, I can obviously never say heal, but, you know, to reverse those symptoms. So I was still, you know, eating a lot of processed food and still had the high stress job and, you know, all the things. And the more I started down that path of holistic health, the more I realized, oh, wait a second, I have some agency over my life. And that's when I, the things really started to shift for me in terms of just being able to heal myself. But then and, and actually, it was interesting. Someone reached out to me just this morning on Instagram and, you know, she was like, oh, I follow you and, you know, I love your stuff. And she goes, I'm actually thinking of becoming a health coach. What do you recommend? And, you know, the advice that I, I sent her a voice message and I said, the advice that I gave her was, I said, one thing that I didn't do when I was in school that I wish I would have, which didn't come until later, was I just thought that it was all about what they teach you in school. And they teach you about the body. They teach you about, you know, holistic health. But there's there's so much more to it. And I wish I would have thought of that as I was going through school. It didn't come until later. But again, going back to that root cause, not just from a body perspective, but from a mind perspective, from a spiritual perspective, from, you know, an energetic perspective, like what got us to this place? And not from a place of blame or shame or guilt or anything like that, but just from a place of curiosity. When you, when you can show up in that place of curiosity and start asking those questions, that's when the real healing can begin. That's when you can really start to get to the bottom of it. You know, taking, taking, I mean, the scientific hat, the health hat is extremely important, but it needs to be in combination with that mindset component and, and looking at these X factors of what got us here in the first place. So that was the advice that I, that I gave her. I said, if you decide to go on this path, I said, I want you to kind of think of it from that perspective, because there's, there's really two sides of this. It's, it's, it's part art and part science. And I'm sure you, you see that with your clients too. It's like, you can tell them all of the things to do, but we're all individual. We were, I, I truly believe in individualized wellness and our bodies are going to respond a little bit differently. So, you know, the science is kind of all the stuff that you, you learn in school, but that art is that lived life experience and figuring out, okay, how can I take this, this knowledge and really make my own body shine? And, and that's where the, 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 really the tweaking comes in. Mm. You know, I love the art piece of this because that's very true. You have outliers where you learn these things, whether it's when you're going to school, doing your certification, your nutrition courses, whatever. And, you know, you've kind of got a, a little, I had a formula going in because my background was, was bodybuilding. And so the way that I 
transformed my body in midlife was to start doing bodybuilding, bikini bodybuilding shows, change my nutrition, got rid of the, I was like you, I, was, I, I had Diet Coke was, I lived on Diet Coke <laughs> and, you know, breakfast was maybe a banana and a muffin if I was lucky and head out the door for a 20 mile run. And you know, you've, you've got all of this knowledge that you gain as you trans, you have your own transformation. And this was a mistake I made initially. I'm like, oh, this worked for me. This certainly is going to work for every woman and quickly found out, oh no, that there's so much here. And then learning about what happens to our bodies in that perimenopausal, menopausal transition that, you know, I, I had to start to really look at the individual. And, you, and you're right, that's where that, that kind of back to the puzzle, you know, looking at the, the puzzle pieces and knowing that what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for another. Yeah. So when you're working with clients, Holly, they come with, come to you, where do you, what, what's the starting point? What is the, what is the methodology that you use with them? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad you asked this, Carol, because this is the Rocky framework. And I named it Rocky after the best comeback it. movie of all time, the original Rocky circa 1976. And yeah, for all the midlife ladies, we remember the, the, the old school Rocky movies. And um, it just like, when I think about a comeback, it really is the best comeback movie. So I named the framework after Rocky, R-O-C-K-Y. So we actually don't start with the doing. We don't start jumping into the nutrition or the exercise or all of the protocols. We start with the rear view mirror and that's R. And this is really when we get right with ourselves. And I help my clients to, we can't jump into a DeLorean and you know go back and change the past. But what you can do is make peace and forgiveness with the past. And that's peace and forgiveness with the other person. It's peace and forgiveness with the situation. But most importantly, it's peace and forgiveness with yourself. And I know for me personally and the women that I work with, when you have more weight on your body than you want to, there's also a lot of shame. There's, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of just, um, I had a lot of self-loathing and just hated the body that was staring back at me in the mirror. And that forgiveness piece is so important because we're, we are literally tethered to all of these events in the past that got us here. And we're tethered to those feelings of shame and loathing and the low self-worth. And a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but it's so important that we address it, that we bring it, we give light to it. And when you can shine a light on it, it's not the scary monster under the bed anymore. When you bring that into the light, you're like, oh, okay. And it's a lot easier to show up in that place where you have that forgiveness. And then it's also important to have that, that, that um, uh, safety in your body to start calming your nervous system down to start calming that cortisol response, to start telling your body that it is safe. And I really feel like this is such an important foundation that everything else just starts to happen a lot more easily. So that's R, which is rear view mirror. And then O is, I like to call own your ship with a P like a boat. So we'll keep it G rated. And <laughs> This is personal responsibility. Carol, you had asked me before about the, the breast cancer and kind of, <laughs> you know, that, that piece of the journey. What I think is important to remember is, or Im important to share, my first appointment with the doctor. I'm 39 years old. I just turned 39. I was a competitive athlete. I weighed 110 pounds. I thought I was the epitome of health. And so I'm at that appointment. not in a woe is me, why me? But I'm in a point of like, how did this even happen? I mean, I just, I literally thought breast cancer was just for old women. Like I did not, I just was completely unaware of any of this. 
And she said two words to me that stuck with me. Those two words were lightning struck. And in that moment, I had the peace that I needed. But it was one of the worst things that a doctor could say because it took all of the responsibility away from me and it just placed the blame of this horrible disease on some random act. Like, ding dong, I go answer the door, I open up the door and there's breast cancer. Happy 39th birthday, Holly. Sucks to be you. Right? Like, in my head, that's how it went down. I was like, oh, okay. Meaning, nothing I can do now. I'm just going to go through treatment. Meaning, I don't need to change any of my habits. So I'm going to keep on doing the things that I'm doing. So I kept on, you know, eating lots of junk food, especially during treatment, which is never good. Um, I kept on living that stress-filled lifestyle. And it took me years. And again, the, the autoimmune disease kicked in. Shocking. My body was screaming, Holly, you need to make some changes. And I didn't listen. So yeah, no, no surprise there. Um, which years later I can look back and say, oh, of course. So, you know, it's, it's good health is not the absence of disease. And I think that's important to, to, to really understand is it took me quite a few years to get to that place where I realized, oh, I have agency over my life. There are lifestyle factors. There's nutrition factors, what I eat, what I drink, who I spend my time with, my thoughts. Uh, environmental toxins. There's so many different factors that go into really whether your body is healthy or not. Let's I'm looking beyond weight at this point, but it's until you can look in yourself in the mirror and say, "I am ready to make this change." And, and I'm sure you see this this too. There's so many. I mean, the secret to weight loss is not gate kept. It's everywhere. You, you gotta uh, uh, you know eat a little less minimize and you know reduce all of the processed food and junk food and sugar and exercise. I mean in its basic form you know it's it's a billion dollar industry it's all over the internet it's everywhere right it is not gatecap. But right how many people listen to the podcast read the books you know do, follow all the influencers and don't take action. So responsibility is key to that place of, I am ready to take action. I am ready for this. So R is rear view mirror. O is own your ship. And these two pieces are more on the mindset component. And the mindset piece is great, but if you only do the mindset piece, you're asking, you're, you're still leaving the question of what do I need to do to actually have a healthy body? And that's where C comes in. And C is create your future self. And I like to think of it from this perspective is that we're not getting any younger. So to look at our our health from what I call the the seven life needs, it's it's, uh, the machine. It's making your body a machine. It's your, your meaning and purpose, your associates, your social spiritual connections, C is your, your uh, calm and inner stillness, lots of time in the quiet, hugely important, very underrated. H is hibernation, sleep. I is your ingredients, all of the food that you eat. N is your uh, time in nature. And then E is your exercise. It's back to the basics. And people, people like to poo-poo the basics. They're like, whatever, the basics. Like, no, the basics are what we need. The basics are what we need on a daily basis. And it's not just going back to the basics. It's going back to the basics from the perspective of what does my 80-year-old self want me to do today? What does my 85-year-old self want me to do today? And then use those habits to create that future self. Meaning we need to eat healthy. We need to strength train. We need to do balance exercises. How many times have you heard older women with the cat or the dog, and they just trip over them, fall, break a hip, and the next thing you know, they're just at a nursing center for the rest of their life, right? I mean, these are the simple things. You think that you're going to love this analogy. So let's say someone's 50 years old 
and let's say they live to the age of 85. So that's 35 years. How many women, Carol, come to you and they say, I hate squats, right? Probably a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So let's do the math. If you're 50 years old, you live to be 85. That's 35 years. On average, we go to the bathroom about eight times a day. And especially in midlife, we're dealing with some pelvic floor issues. So it, it's usually a little more, but let's just say eight times a day. So eight times a day times 35 years, give or take a few, we're doing 100,000 squats over the rest of our life, right? That's a lot mm -hmm. of squats. So you can hate squats all you want, but guess what? When, when you're 80 years old and you want to go to the bathroom by yourself and just be able to get up and not have to have someone help you, that's where squats come in. You know, how, how many do you want to unload the groceries? from the car and, and carry the, the cat litter in, you know, or just be able to drive independently. You know, women live longer than men. So we're going to need to live independently. We're going to want to do the things we're going to want to be when our, when our kids call and they say, Hey, we're taking the grandkids to the, to the zoo all day. You want to be able to say, I'm in, let's go. You don't want to look at your body and say, Oh, uh, you can just park me on a bench and I'll just sit there and watch the world go by while you guys go have fun or I'm just going to stay home, right? We want to be able to do these things when we get older. And, and I know it's hard. So many people are like, I have so many fires in front of me right now. I can't think 15 minutes out, let alone 15 years. But it's important that we do the things today to feed that future self. So, so yeah. Yes, yes. I love that. The idea of, yes, we're, we're doing all these squats and I have to tell you, squats saved my life when I went through spinal surgery at the beginning of the summer because you cannot use that lower back. You can't bend forward at the waist. So it was like doing this uh, hack squat, which is a type of squat that works the front of the, of the quads for the listeners. And boy, was I happy I had done all those squats because I would have to come up on my tiptoe, lean into the, the quad and use the strength of my quad to power up without hurting my back. And I oh, thought, wow. wow, if somebody didn't have this and I'm 63, how would they manage? Would they be in, in a nursing home? Would they be in a rehab? How would they manage to get up and down? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, but here's kind of the problem is that if we only focus on the healthy lifestyle habits, we mm -hmm. still haven't answered the question, well, how do I get it to stick? How do I make this sustainable? Right. Back to the, the base camp cycle. So that's where K comes in. This is keep the vision, not the view. And we're going to put the FBI hat back on because this is important in that 100% of the time, those daily obstacles happen. They are going to want to throw us off course every single day. It is something it's raining outside and you wake up and you're like, Oh, I don't want to leave the house and go to the gym. Or, um, you know, it's, it's you, uh, you're running late. You got in an argument with your spouse, the, the dog pooped on the floor, your spouse <laughs> pooped on the floor. I don't know. You know, you left your keys in the car. I mean, <laughs> There's a million things that happen to us every single day. You know, you're running late in traffic, all the things. And, and it's not just that it causes you to go back to that. I'm just going to do it on Monday. It kind of causes a little bit of the spiral. And when that spiral happens, you, you get amped up and you, 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 you want to eat more you know, junk food. You don't want to exercise. You're, you're amped up. So you're going to bed at night. You're not sleeping well. You're tossing and turning, which then the next day you wake up, you're tired. You're not going to want to exercise. Your body's going to be craving more junk food. Like it's a whole cycle. And, and so many people, again, back to what we talked about, like you, you start relying on willpower when the thing gets hard and the obstacles happen. You're like, oh, it's just easier to not do that. So when you can keep the vision, not the view, this is when it's not about removing the stress in your life. Because it's always going to be there. We're always going to have the career and the family and the kids and the spouse and the aging parents. Like it's always going to be there. So it's not about, oh, just be stress free or oh, just self care. You know, you go for a massage, you're like, oh, I feel like jello. But then you're back in the car turning the, the ignition on. You're like feeling all that stress again. You're like, wait, I just, it didn't work, right? 
So when we can look at it from the perspective, in the FBI, we called it tripwires. And what this does is actually to help you look at those daily threats so that they don't trip you up. Kind of the whole point of the, the tripwire, right? And, and that's what I teach my students how to do is to be able to coexist with the stress and the demands so that they're not thrown off their game. So that, oh, I had a client, um, she said, I just like total crazy family drama that happened out of the blue one weekend. And she's like, I wasn't planning for it. It just kind of happened out of the blue. But she was like, I held my boundaries. I said, no, I didn't people please all the things. And I didn't reach for the junk food. Like this is where this comes in. I'll give you a great example. I was up at uh, MIT. I was giving a, a speech at MIT. And I was actually had to come back to my hometown and give another speech. So it was back to back. That flight had to be tight. And, and I was waiting for the flight. It was delayed three hours. And I just was like, no stress. I had everything under control. I just got out my laptop and started working. But the psychology major of me, I was always, I was watching. I was watching everyone around me. And there was three groups of people. There was the group of people that went up to the flight attendants and just started screaming at them because the flight was mm-hmm. delayed. You know, don't you understand? I have somewhere important to go. Okay, we all do. Um, yeah, so they came completely unhinged. There was a group of people that went to Dunkin' Donuts and they got their bagels, they got their, their donuts, and they ate their stress. And then the third group, they went to the bar, eight o'clock in the morning. They went to the bar and drank. <laughs> They drank their feelings, right? So, but this is how our, again, our brain is back to wanting to to find that homeostasis. So again, the stress is always going to happen. So it's learning to coexist with it so that it doesn't hijack your day. So we've got R is rear view mirror. O is uh, own your ship with a P. C is create your future self. K is keep the vision, not the view. And then Y is really where it's all about just coming back home to you. And, you know, being in that place, like you said, you were 63, like, you know, I'm 53, like people look at us and they're like, wait, you're how old, you know, (laughs) because you're coming back to that place where you're living as your vibrant self and realizing, you know, back to the, the Wizard of Oz, like, oh, I had it inside of me all along, right? We have this inside of us. It's just finding it. It's, it's spending enough time in the quiet to find it again. Because we've lost it. There's so much noise going on. It's hard to find it again. And coming back to that place, coming back home to to you. In fact, my my program is actually called Back to You because that's really what it is. It's coming back home to you. But I think what's more important, it's not just about you. It's about everyone else in your life. Because we want to leave our legacy. And when you're at this point, people are in training on your energy. They're asking you, I want what you have. How did you do this? And they're now saying, I want to eat a little healthier. I want to start exercising more. I want to start taking better care of my body without you even saying a word. And that is what the comeback story, that's what the Rocky framework, that is what Back to You is all about. I love the name. I I love how you've broken it down step by step. I love a good step by step process. You know, looking at all of those steps what do you th- what is the biggest challenge that you see women facing when they decide okay i i'm ready i want my comeback story i want a transformation of some sort here what what is the biggest obstacle challenge that you see that they face yeah i think the biggest obstacle is themselves is that they've they've tried the diet they failed they just don't believe in themselves And, you know, and I think having a good coach, like what you do, what I do, having a good coach in your corner to say, I'm going to believe in you until you can believe in yourself. And, and I know when I first started down this, this process and I had, you know, my coach and I was like, wow, that's holding that space is really powerful because when you're in a place where you don't believe in yourself and someone else is there showing up and believing in your full potential, you're like, okay, maybe I can actually do this. But it's hard to get back, get past that place of, I just don't think I can do it. I don't know if I have it in me one more time. What if I fail again? That is huge. I know you've had women say this to you where they're thinking about signing up with you, doing your program. I, I know they've said it to me and they'll say, I hope this works. Yes. And that's such a tough one to answer because what I hear in there when I hear that I hope it's almost like they're already anticipating 
Yeah. Oh, it's not going to work for me. And it's really hard to address that. Yeah. And, and the other piece of that is the self-sabotage. So, you know, so often like they want to get started on something or they don't get started. And then they kind of, you know, like you said, like, I hope like they're going to sabotage their way out of it before even kind of taking those first few steps. Mm. And, and, and again, they, it's just a, it's a protection mechanism. That's all it is. It is. It is. And the more somebody has had, e even the past traumas, like what we talked about, sometimes there, there is this protection, even with um, excess pounds and weight, yeah. where it can be threatening. I've actually worked with women where they start to reach their goal and they, they'll, they'll almost panic a little bit because that's been such a protect, protective mechanism for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm sure you've seen the same. And, and then the piece about the personal responsibility, I really feel um, strongly about that. This past summer, I don't know, I, I don't know if you do this, but I go through times where there'll be a theme that just really stands out to me for whatever reason. And after my surgery, it was the personal responsibility, but getting out of a victimhood. Like, like, what can I take control of? I don't want to be a victim. And, and I was thinking of myself, okay, I can't do X, Y, and Z. I can't go do a heavy deadlift. I can't do all of these things I've been doing for years. I've got to heal my body. But what can I take control of in the here and now? Okay, I can get outside and walk. I can take control of my nutrition. I can do some light band exercises. And I think it's so, so important not to fall into that victimhood. Yeah. And what's interesting is, so in uh, 2022, I went through a divorce and I actually used this methodology as I was going through my divorce and I did the responsibility was so hard. I will be honest with you. It was brutal to look at myself in the mirror and not blame everything on my, my, my yeah. ex, but I did. But what was interesting was because I took that responsibility for my part in the marriage, my part in the divorce. And when we showed up to, you know, kind of figure things out, it, it really, it knocked the wind out of his sails because I wasn't showing up with bitterness or anger or resentment or, you know, you know, I gave you the best years of my life. You deserve to give me what, blah, 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 blah. you know, there was none of that. It was me just showing up in my responsibility saying, let's just knock this out. And he had nothing to grab onto. I didn't give him anything. So he was like, oh, okay. And we just figured it out. And it was insane. Like I was so shocked. People were like, how did you do that? I said, I don't even know. I was like, I know the methodology works. I was like, but this still even shocked me. <laughs> and that's how powerful it really is. And, and were you using that rear view mirror? Okay. You took yes. yourself through the process. Absolutely. You know, that, that one hit me strongly because I, I will often reflect reflect back. I'll look in that rear view mirror, but I have to be really careful because I'll look back with regret, mm -hmm. which doesn't do me any yeah. good at all. You cannot go back and change the past and right. I'll ruminate a little bit. E even the health part of it, it took me, it took me so long to figure out the, the nutritional piece and the exercise piece. And I think, oh, I wasted decades. What was I thinking? I wasted time. Um, wasted time not believing in myself. And so I'm, I'm sure you run into that. You've, you've done it yourself. It, oh, yeah. Look, look back. But then how do you deal with the regret aspect of yeah. looking back? And, and really, it's just, it's, it's almost like that brain entrainment. It's just saying, okay, everything, and, and I've got a coin here, right? Mm -hmm. So one side of the coin is all of our negative experiences and the traumas and all the things. Well, the other side of the coin is our superpower. So when we can take this negative stuff and say, this built us to become the human that we are, and we are who we are today because of it, and we can turn that around and now use it as our superpower. And, you know, really it's just a lot of, a lot of brain entrainment, but it's, it's, it's actually not that hard to do. It's just knowing how to do it. If that makes mm. sense. It does make sense. And I think all of the mistakes we make through life, they're learning experiences and that's data. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's back to that puzzle. And you use yep. data a lot in the FBI, I'm sure, to figure things out and to be a little bit objective and curious, as you mentioned, at the forefront instead yeah. of the self-blame. 
I go, okay, well, why did I do this? And what did I learn from this? And what can I take forward instead of looking back with the woe is me? I really screwed it all up (laughs) mentality, you know, taking, taking what we've learned forward. So, so important. Uh, Holly, I want to be respectful of your time as we start to wrap up. What advice can you give women in, I'd, I'd say in that midlife? And when I think midlife, I think 40, 50, even, even 60. Yeah. What would be a, a num- your number one piece of advice for them? Oh, my goodness. Um, I would just say it's never too late. And it, it, even more than that, you are important. And it's so easy to put everyone else's needs above your own. But, you know, the world is not going to collapse if if you say yes to yourself, but it's eventually going to collapse if you don't put yourself first. You So you've got to just, you know, love yourself, put yourself first, make your health a priority. And yeah, it's never too late to start. Beautiful advice, because I think a lot of women do struggle with that, making themselves a priority, seeing it as selfish, feeling guilty about it, when in reality, we can't help anyone else if we don't have our health, if we don't take care of ourselves. So such great advice. Holly, how can the listeners connect with you, learn more about you and work with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say the first place to start, since you're already listening to this podcast episode, is head on over to my podcast, Your Midlife Comeback Story. And I would write this number down, episode 136. And you are actually going to do a deep dive into uncovering your covert weight loss blocks using FBI inspired tactics. So it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite episodes. Um, there's also a quiz in that episode too that you can take. And you're, you'll get some really, really fun results to learn what your weight loss blocks are. So again, your Midlife Comeback Story Podcast, episode 136. And then come say hello on Instagram at holly.bertone and just say hello. Let me know you listen to the show and, and let me know what your biggest takeaway was. Oh, thank you so much, Holly. I'll make sure this is all in the show notes. Episode 136, you said, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. We will link to that in the show notes. I, I'm curious now. I, I'm going to have to go check that out. But thank you again. It's been just a delight meeting you and and having this conversation. Oh, thank you so much, Carol. And to our listeners, wherever you are in the world, we wish you every blessing. Bye for now.